All right, so I'd like to begin with a land acknowledgement. So today we're gathered across the lands known as Ontario on the traditional territory of many First Nations. I am joining um, you here today from Toronto, which is the traditional territory of the Anishinaabe, including the Mississaugas of the New Credit, um, the Wendat and the Haudenosaunee people. It's covered by the Williams Treaty and uh, the Toronto Purchase Treaty 12. And uh, it's important to take this time to reflect on uh, whose territory uh, we live and get to play and work on and uh, reflect on our role as uh, stewards of the environment and guests of this place. So uh, the Oak Ridge Marine Land Trust is the organization that I work for and who is hosting this presentation tonight. Um, we help preserve land forever on the Oak Ridge's Marine. We do this in a variety of ways. We have uh, a number of properties. A lot of them are conservation easements where we work with landowners. Um, a few of them are um, conservation reserves that we own. And uh, some of them are restrictive covenants as well. And uh, some of the properties uh, like the Beaten Heritage Forest, we own with municipalities. And so that gives an extra uh, level of uh, protection beyond legislation, um, particularly when we, um, we own, own properties with another group. Um, so land trusts are uh, nonprofits, charitable organizations that acquire land uh, for the purposes of conservation. Um, they, lay, they raise money to purchase these lands and to protect them, and uh, they can receive donations of lands and easements, and uh, we're required to protect these sites um, forever. They're really protected in perpetuity. So um, we do all sorts of things to protect the rain. One of them is connecting people with nature. We do a lot of educational programming, and that includes what we're doing here today. We also do things like uh, guided nature walks and school visits, and we show up at places like farmers markets, and uh, we do all sorts of that kind of thing. Um, we help protect green corridors um, and habitat corridors between um, conservation areas that's vital for the movement of uh, wildlife. Uh, we support climate change resiliency, protecting um, significant places, particularly wetlands uh, across the moraine. We, um, a lot of our work is done with the support of the Federal Ecological Gifts Program, which is a fantastic tool where landowners can uh, still live on their properties um, but have conservation easements and they get uh, amazing tax benefits for that while the habitat gets protected and wildlife gets uh, supported. And um, a, lot of our, um, a lot of our work is also supported through uh, legacy giving, um, through uh, things like wills. So uh, as I mentioned earlier, we're, uh, right now we're working on the Kirtland's Warbler Habitat Restoration Project uh, with volunteer seed collectors. Um, this past November, we did our first seeding. We got lots of acorns out there and uh, native wildflower seeds. I'm really excited to see what the site looks like next spring when things start to grow. Um, looking for lots of volunteers um, to help out with the uh, seed collection. And um, right now we have a project that's aimed for people uh, age 55 plus in Northumberland uh, to help out as seed collectors, uh, but anyone can help out. And we encourage anyone who's interested in birds and ecology and uh, the environment to uh, be a part of this. And so we will uh, put a volunteer registration link in the chat and uh, you can check out our website, oakmajorsmarine.org uh, to um, find out more. And we have a few more um, webinars coming up over the next little while. Um, we have one on wildflowers, which uh, will be the same time next week um, on the Tuesday, the 20th, which will also be hosted by Sean. And then uh, the next uh, Tuesday, we have one uh, hosted by um, Sammy, who did the uh, webinar on winter plant ID last week. Um, so that's going to be at 12, like over noon. And then after that, um, on March 5th, we have uh, one that we just announced today, which is going to be about using the app iNaturalist, which is an amazing tool um, for identifying um, plants and other um, species um, that really, really helps you uh, learn the plants and wildlife around you. So um, without further ado, I'm going to hand it over to Sean and we're going to begin our presentation this evening. Thank you so much for joining us. Awesome. Thank you. I'm very excited. I'm very impressed by everything that you're doing there as well. Uh, it's uh, it's important and it's also just wonderful to educate people and, and to associate with people who are like-minded. Um, it's... Uh, I was at a symposium today, a plant symposium in Ottawa for our industry, and uh, it's it's neat to see how many people are engaging with nature. It's uh, it's a sort of a new and fabulous thing 
in many ways, or at least the momentum is new. Um, so um, today we're going to talk about trees and shrubs. Um, we're going to go through several different species, black oak, red oak, bur oak, and if it's not bur oak, don't fix it. So I had to get that out of my system before we got going. Uh, but in agree, one of my favorite plants, uh, it's a plant I grew up with, black cherry, eastern hop hornbeam, also known as ironwood. And then we're going to talk about common bearberry, not barberry, uh, New Jersey tea, oddly plant, really deserves a place in the landscape more, choke cherry, smooth rose, snowberry, another one of my faves, uh, late low bush blueberry, meadow sweet century, common juniper, uh, and I have snowberry twice. That's how much I like it. <laughs> so before we get into the plants, uh, we have to talk about sort of the, the botany side of things. Uh, be careful with common names. Um, there are many common names for each different thing. There's a neat plant. Uh, some people know it as wood beetony. And uh, when I looked it up, I found it as greater lousewort. And I thought, I don't want to have greater lousewort in my garden. Um, and I, I looked it up and one of the names is snaffles. So I'm going to be calling it snaffles because that's just adorable. Who doesn't want snaffles in their garden? But there's a lot of different common names for each different plant is my point. Uh, so when we're looking at woody plants, it's it's all in the details. We're going to look at bud details and arrangement. Uh, the big thing is opposite versus alternate. Leaf shape, bark. And, and when we talk about leaf shape, compound versus not. Uh, the edges and the venation, the veining patterns in the leaf. Uh, bark, texture, color patterning. In, in some cases, bam, you're done. It's easy. And in others, you get into more subtle sides of things. So that's important to know. Um, and what are the flowers like? How are they put together? Like the different flowers, maybe all together in one. Um, the shape of the flowers, obviously color. And uh, also fruit. Uh, again, arrangement, shape, and color. So um, the big place to start, in my opinion, is alternate versus opposite. What do I mean by that? Well, if you look at these pictures here, uh, there are buds. Uh, not opposite each other, they're alternate. There's a bud here, it's tough to see, and there's a bud there, so they're not opposite each other. Whereas this, this is bladder nut, uh, Staphylia trifolia. And I'm gonna often give you the botanical names because there's no confusion in them. Don't be scared by that. You already know more than you think you do, but you're not gonna believe me if I just tell you that. Uh, but see here, the buds are opposite each other in the center photo, and that's the case all the way down. You can't always tell by the branches because one little branch might die off, leaving only one. But if you look at the buds, they will be opposite versus alternate, which really is just not opposite. Uh, and then you look at the structure of the buds. So this is serviceberry. And serviceberry has very pointy buds, almost like beech, and uh, little fuzzy hairs where the edges meet. Uh, we would call this imbricate or scaled. Um, and, and learning these terms helps fix it in your brain also. I mean, I'm a little freaky when it comes to plants. I just love them to pieces. Uh, so I remember things that a lot of people don't. Sugar maple has buds similar to this, but not quite as long and skinny. Um, <clears throat> so you'll you'll learn the details as you go. Don't be daunted by the hugeness of the picture. Never do that. Uh, there's far too much information in the world. You don't buy a phone and sit down and memorize the manual. You don't even come with manuals anymore. Instead, you might say, what do I need to do today? Well, I want to make a call. A little icon looks like a phone. Let's try that. Bit by bit learning is the way you're going to get to this. Uh, you're not going to leave here tonight knowing everything. So um, this is from an old book called Hortus Third, but it's still got a lot of very effective information in it. These are most of the different leaf patterns. The big things are going to be... Um, is it compound? And there's a bunch of different shapes of compound, like Kentucky coffee tree here, which is bipinnate, uh, and pinnate, which means that it has uh, leaves opposite each other. Well, the leaflet branches once. This, the leaflet, this is all one leaf, and it branches twice. So that's bipinnate. And then you can have odd pinnate or even pinnate, just to make it. So most ferns that you know would be odd pinnate. Um, and this is called palmate, palmately compound because it looks like a little hand. So something like um, Ohio Buckeye would be palmately compound. Um, and there's, there's other things like trifoliate and so on. When you look at the edges of the leaves, if it doesn't have anything at all, it is entire. And some of these are pretty, my mom was an English teacher, so she taught me about root words. So serrate, um, where's serrate? There it is. So serrate, it's serrated. 
If it's got bigger ones of those, then it might be dentate or lobe. Uh, ciliate means it's got little hairs along the edge. And it gets all fancy, propoliate and peltate and so on. Um, some of you may know a plant called bone set that is perfoliate, so is cup plant. The stem goes right through to joined leaves, so that's perfoliate. You don't have to memorize all this stuff, but having something like this, and uh, I, I assume that this will be sent out as a PDF to people and they'll have a uh, recording of it as well. Are we recording? Is this a recording thing? It is, okay, good. I didn't see the little alarm go off. That's because I wasn't paying attention. Um, so these are all important details. It's all about details. Um, so this is one of the easy ones. And we're not getting into this yet, but this looks like burnt cornflakes. This is probably the most distinctive tree in our forest. If it's a burnt cornflake bark, then it's a black cherry. So learning textures like this. And you feel a huge sense of accomplishment. As soon as you learn something easy like this, it makes it better to build on your next bit of knowledge. I know one. Now I'm ready to learn the next one. Another easy one is uh, ironwood or eastern hop hornbeam. And there we are with that common name thing. I learned desire. What can I say? Australia virginiana. And this one's kind of neat because it's got these thin strips, about a centimeter or so, depending on the edge of the tree, across. And they peel away from the bark laterally. So they're often held. Here's the trunk. And if you look at my little icon here. And then it's sort of joined in the middle and it sticks out on either end. So it's very distinctive, a little bit shaggy, but not nearly as shaggy as shag bark. Um, but this surprisingly uh, distinctive. Uh, you get into flower shapes. So we have spikes and a racine, which is like a spike, but the flowers have extended from it. Corums, uh, so you've got, it's like a shortened spike in some ways. Panicles, think lilac, that's a nice easy one. Um, one that people are readily familiar with. Not a great plant, although tiger swallowtoes like them. Umble, like an umbrella. Nice and easy. That's so um, Queen Anne's lace or carrots would be a good example of that. And, and I think we're going to talk about a plant that has umble flowers. Campanulate means bell-shaped. Funnel form, like a funnel. Nice and easy. Um, rotate, like a rose, uh, is, is pretty straightforward. Bilabiate, so tulips. So this is um, things like... Uh, Great blue lobelia would be a good example uh, of that. Um, so now we're going to jump into the plants. Um, I should turn on my chat window so that people have questions. I love sh <laughs> shagberry hickory light. Nice. It really is shagberry hickory light. <laughs> um, so Brunus serotina, which means mm, late, um, has beautiful fall color. The leaves are uh, serrate, they're small little teeth, very clear, not like most cherries. This has a very lightly textured, almost shiny leaf, this burnt cornflake bark, uh, and these flowers hang, I've only ever seen them hanging down, white, a little bit fragrant, beloved by pollinators in general. Uh, this is a great plant, by the way, for the landscape, and a lot of cherries suffer from black knot, um, which looks like a raccoon pooped on the branch. This doesn't get that. So it's a great landscape companion and, and as I said, gorgeous fall color. So fairly simple. Now, alternate or opposite? There was something I didn't tell you back then. Here's a nice little bit of knowledge. There are only two trees in our trees, in our native canopy that are opposite. <laughs> Ash, which you don't see many of anymore, and maple. Those are the only two opposite trees. So if you look at the bud structure, so let me go back. There we go. If you look at the bud structure and it's like this and it's a tree, then it's either ash or maple. If it isn't, then now you start going through the other, the other bits and pieces. Um, so that burnt cornflake bark though, you don't have to go too far beyond that. Uh, it often has these little pink bits that used to hold the leaf. Uh, and I'm trying not to get technical all the time on you, uh, but this burnt corp like bark makes it a giveaway. And cherries have a pretty, I don't actually have a picture of it, they have a pretty pointed bud. Uh, I think we do later when we get to the Canada plum. In fact, I know we do. Uh, so we talked about fruit. So the fruit arrangement, uh, very distinctive. If you want to tell different pines from each other, 
we only have a certain number of pines. The cones are all distinctly, distinctly different. Acorns are all distinctly different. So if it's got a cap on it, like our guy on the right here, um, then, and that cap extends most of the way over the cone and it's kind of fringy on the edge uh, and, and very scaled. The scales are bumpy. That's bur oak, deadly, easy, super easy. This little guy here, the classic acorn, uh, that would be red oak. Um, and we'll get to uh, black oak in a bit. Black oak's a little tougher. Uh, lucky you. Uh, but these little distinctions, like I said, details matter. These are all very important. Uh, so here's black oak here. And it looks very similar, frankly, to red oak. The leaves are lobed with points, just like red oak. Um, and the bark is a little bit like dinosaur skin in that it's it's big and scaly. Um, the acorns are bigger. Can I have a picture there? No. Um, the acorns are a bit bigger. Now, I don't have a picture of it because they're only, it's not distinctive to me. So when I went through this thinking of you, I thought about what would really stand out. So with these, if you look at the buds, and buds are a really good way to recognize trees. These look just like red oak buds, but they're fuzzy. And the undersides of the leaves are often a bit fuzzy. Sometimes you can recognize things by location. Black oaks are, are going to be common on sandy soil. The leaves on black oaks are more deeply incised, so the, the lobes cut deeper into the leaf. And there are five to nine lobes on a black oak, so that a few less lobes, and seven to 11 on red oak, which there's overlap there. So it's not absolute when you look at it. Um, the the big thing, the, the deadlock, is these buds. Uh, the bark is a bit more corky, um, and the cap uh, encloses almost half of the acorn, um, whereas it's only a third to a quarter on red oak, that guy on the left. Uh, so that, that cap would come down much further on the black oak. Um, but if you're not sure, um, then, then the buds are a good way to do it. Now, the buds aren't going to do you any good at all in spring because everything's just elongating. Um, that Those buds contain all of the ability to grow the stem and to grow the leaves. That's all in there in miniature form. So you lose the buds in the spring. You're not going to be able to see that at all. Um, but uh, if this were me, I'd be, I'd be, you know, printing this out and taking this out as a little book with me because some of these little, we would call this a, a simple key, being able to tell one from the other. Keys are really cool, by the way. There's a wonderful book uh, called Woody Plants in Winter. Uh, it's, I don't know, you can find used copies still, but it's a fabulous book for identifying woody plants in Ontario when there's no leaves on the trees. And it just breaks it down bit by bit. Is it this or that? If it's this, go to question two. If it's that, go to question 35. And it, it slowly works you through the identification process. Um, bur oak, pretty easy, I would say. We talked about the acorn already. Now, bur oaks have lobed leaves, okay? big round lobes. And what makes bur oak distinctive from white oak and some of the others is that it has a waist. So you see the top here is not deeply lobed. And then you got a little lobe here. And then it cuts way in down. So look at a bunch of leaves, but it, you can see it in the next one down. Nature is variable. Okay, that's important to remember. You're not necessarily going to know from one leaf, unless it's something really distinctive like sassafras. Um, then, you know, you think you see the sassafras bark and so on, and all you got to do is look around on the ground, and there's nothing like a sassafras leaf, so that one's easy. But look for this waste um, on, on bark. And also, the uh, you're going to have this quirkiness that's very common. And if you look at them, they look a bit shaggy. They get uh, a lot of branches coming up from the sides of the tree. We would call that epicormic branching, so growing from dormant or latent buds. So they're not a neat and tidy looking tree. Uh, the buds are nothing to write home about. I don't find this terribly um, symptomatic, might be the word. Um, so I look for the bark. I look for that waste on the leaf, and I look for this shagginess, this epicormic branching. Uh, lovely tree, great for biodiversity, but not a neat and tidy tree. And bulletproof. You'll see this growing in every condition. I have 
very wet soil where I live. Um, and uh, the water table is just below the soil and we're on crushed topography, limestone topography here. Um, uh, yeah, if, if, um, if when trees are young, I'm just looking at the chat window here. Um, and uh, I, I see someone's mentioning that it, it starts to get that cork on it when it's two years old. Uh, so that's a really good question. Actually, I'll try and keep a better eye on the chat window. Um, yeah, I would say oaks always have terminal buds. And again, you'll see these two buds here are not opposite. So that tells you that it's not an ash or a maple. Not a mountain ash, that's a different kettle of fish. Uh, <clears throat> there we go. Um, so here's red oak. So we looked at black oak. Red oak has no fuzziness on the buds. They're almost a little bit pyramidal. There are little tiny ridges here that are tough to see in a photograph. You can see it a little bit there. And uh, there's what Anya was talking about again with the multiple buds at the end. Um, if you're seeing it during the growing season, which is when you'll be looking for acorns anyway, um, you can see very clear, shiny leaves and pointed lobes. Now, remember when we talked about black oak, those lobes are, are deeper and um, there are five to seven on black oak and seven to 11 on red. Um, and the bark on red oak is pretty darn distinctive. Now I'm, I'm face blind and face blindness is a kryptonite that comes with a, uh, a superpower. The superpower is that face blind people recognize texture like it's nobody's business. So I walk through a forest and, and I'm like, there's red oak because they have these long, smooth stripes and then some ridgy bits, very technical, ridgy bits in between. See these long, smooth stripes, if you follow my mouse there? Um, that's very distinctive of red oak. Um, so good to see it. And, and you're, you're going to be looking for these when they're mature anyway. Uh, and remember that oaks, many trees, but especially uh, oaks, mast every few years. So they produce a lot of acorns every few years. Um, what is the swelling on the, oh, way back. That, that might be a gall. I'm not positive in this case. Usually galls are on leaves in my experience. So there are flies and wasps that make galls and midges, well, midges are flies, that uh, lay eggs and then the grub releases uh, a hormone that makes the leaf grow around it. And they're not really harmful to the plant um, I'm, I'm not sure if they could ever be harmful because it's making the plant more, make more chlorophyll. Usually these will be on the veins of the leaves and they're pretty funky actually. Pin oak is famous for getting, well, pin oak gall. Um, and in fact, that's, that's interesting that that's been touched on already. Um, oh, and most people say that red oak is the best, uh, host for larvae. That's according to Doug Talmay's research, but I don't have the individual research on other oak species. Uh, Doug would tell us that uh, somewhere around 530 uh, species of Lepidoptera, caterpillar and moth larva feed on the leaves of oak trees. So that's a neat question. Great biodiversity engine uh, to have in your garden. Um, most pests and diseases are host specific. So I, I think I may end up showing you black knot on a plum later. And, and that only affects plums. A pin oak gall would never affect a maple tree. Um, red oak is the one most vulnerable to oak wilt. And it's very important that we don't prune red oaks or oaks in general, but especially the, the pointy lobed oaks um, that we only prune them really in November. That's if we don't, prune them, we're the main vector for the disease. Uh, if we if we don't prune them for most of the year, and then if they really need pruning in November, uh, then we won't spread the disease as fast. We won't draw in the sap beetle that spreads the disease. Uh, if, a, if you have to prune a branch, then uh, shellac it right away. Normally we don't do that. Don't put wound paint on a tree, but this is a new exception. You guys are on the ball, by the way. These are good questions. I like that you're so engaged. Um, so we looked at the red oak acorn, and I love these little um, scales that are on it as well. They're very distinctive. It's so cute. Now, one of my faves, bitternut hickory, dead in the forest, dead straight trunk. 
very distinctive for that. Uh, bitternut hickory has very clear, smooth bark, uh, not a lot of texture to it. The hickory nut itself, beloved by all sorts of creatures. And um, it's a little, it's more rounded than most and more smooth than most other hickories. Hickory is easy when it's got buds on it. Super, super easy. It's it's super distinctive. Nothing, nothing else has these sulfur buds. And they almost look a little granulated as well. But the sulfur color, when you see hickory seedlings in the winter or anytime once the, everything settled down for the season, they have those sulfur buds on them. Obviously, like I said, not when the new growth is there. But dead clear bark, super straight trunk if it's in a forest setting. This is my neighbors across the street, um, and uh, which is handy. Um, so it's in the open, so it's much more heavily branched lower down. Um, but uh, yeah, dead straight trunk and uh, these sulfur buds. It also has a compound leaf. Um, and this is pretty typical of bitternut hickories. You've got uh, uh, <laughs> seven. Me math bad. I plant good, but I math bad. Um, seven different uh, segments to it there. Um, now here, oh, there it is right there. If you look very closely, you'll see a little sulfur bud. Uh, so even, even here in this setting, super, super distinctive. Now this one's got a little bit more ridging on it. Um, so that's good to know as well. Um, there, nature's variable. There, there are a few, I'm trying to point out to you the super locks as far as identification goes. Um, now, so, um, by the way, feel free, if you have questions about things, feel free to show them in the chat window. I've got the chat window front and center over my camera. Um, so when you think I'm looking at you, no, I'm looking at questions. Um, and I worry that I'm moving too fast, but we also have a lot to cover tonight. Eastern hop hornbeam. So there's our doubly serrate thing. So the teeth have teeth. Uh, these, if you see these flower or fruiting structures, super easy to identify. They have these little flattened bladders, very, very easy. Um, nothing quite like it in the forest. I mean, elms have these two, but not in the same sort of hanging chain, not quite this distinctive, but uh, very clear leaf, serrate, and the bark. If you see this leaf, but not the flower and not the bark, it could be an elm. But if you see the leaf and uh, the fruit, you should keep calling the fruit and the bark with these little centimeter wide. Um, does the bark always have a twist? No, it does not. That's actually really neat. Um, I run down the rabbit hole a lot, forgive me. What is distinctive is the way it's peeling away that and the centimeter wide strips. That's, I've never seen an exception. That is always uh, Eastern hop hornby or a stray. Um, now, the twists, that's really cool. That's the wind pushing on the tree. We call it the sail for obvious reasons. And if the canopy of the tree is a little off, then like asymmetrical, then the wind will push on it slightly more one way than the other, and it will twist the tree. And you'll see that on, on lots of trees, especially in open settings, which as you can see, this one is. Um, but it's a, it's a really neat thing. It's one of the things that causes what we call frost cracks as well. Not the only thing, but one of the things. Um, so... The bark is the lock for this one. And these are very slow grower. If you see a decent size one of these, it's very old, uh, very hard wood. This is another tree I grew up with. I grew up over by Crawford Lake, by the way. I went to the Niagara Park School of Horticulture uh, where we had an arboretum there. And I'm also a master gardener, but really when it comes right down to it, I'm just a nature freak. I just love all this stuff. As I'm sure you can tell. Um, yeah, pretty straightforward on that one. You see, I'm not getting too far into the weeds, pardon the pun. I'm sticking to the easy to identify features. If this, then that. How big does the trunk? It looks a little like cherry bark when it's younger. Oh, apropos, here's a cherry for how handy, if anything. Um, I'm not sure on age. We know from Peter Wollenben from The Hidden Life of Trees that we're notoriously wrong on how old trees are if they're in a forest. Um, yeah, it's this this tree when it's young looks a little bit uh, cherry-ish. It's got the a little bit more smoothness, a little more lenticels. It's misleading when it's young. Another thing, actually, and I didn't think to put this in the slides, 
in the winter, beech trees, some oaks and some maples will hold their leaves. We say it has a poor abscission flare. It doesn't drop its leaves easily in the winter. Um, when they're young, now you don't care about it when it's young anyway, because your job is to go out and hunt seeds. But just for, for giggles, um, when they're young, they hold their leaves very well in the winter. So if you see something that has doubly serrate leaves and they tend to twist up a bunch and they're lower down there on a young plant, then that would be your uh, uh, hop hornbeam. I have trouble calling it by hop hornbeam, but that's the name that's listed. So that's what we're going with. Um, so that's a, that is an easy way to recognize them when they're young. I wouldn't look at the bark and go, that's a hop hornbeam in the winter without a fair bit of work. And that's me. Now, uh, choke cherry. Uh, hmm. Okay, get ready on your keyboards. Is this alternate or opposite? Anyone? Yeah. Way to go, Anne. Nice. It is, in fact, look at, look at everybody go. Ooh, shark worms. Now we're getting fancy. Um, yes, it is alternate. Okay, now, um, I am. Uh, so, uh, see the way the buds also stick out? This plant looks incredibly like buckthorn. Buckthorn. Gah! But buckthorn's buds hug the stem. They are oppressed to the stem. Cherry buds stick out from the stem. So that's super important because we don't want you collecting buckthorn for anything. Um, when they're for quite an amount of time in their life, their their buds are or their bark is fairly clear with these lenticels. This is how plants breathe, trees breathe through smooth bark. Oops, too. Um, the stick out from the stem is super important. Um, I think I have a picture of buckthorn later for you. I can't remember. Uh, but this is where I say it over and over again: details matter. Okay, the way these buds stick out is super important. You can make a cheat sheet from all this too. Um, and Anya said, look for the black knot. This has a more colloquial name that I don't think I should probably share with you. Um, although I feel wimpy saying poop on a stick. But anyway, uh, this is a very distinctive disease. It only affects cherries and plums, not all cherries and plums. Like I said, black cherry does not get this. Um, but it is really, really distinctive and very debilitating. Uh, there's a lovely purple leaf variety of this called Schubert. And uh, it gets it, uh, just a sidebar, the treatment for it is to prune it in August or October. The disease is not virulent at that point, and I've extended the lives of these plants many times. See how the flowers stick more upright? The black cherry hung down. The black cherry had, black cherries are just big for starters, um, but these are smaller trees, uh, often, but not always multi-stem. The leaf is not as shiny as uh, black cherry leaves are, and the fruit, uh, same with black cherry leaves, actually, uh, the black cherry fruit, they're red. Um, you're not going to want to eat these. Yes, you can harvest them, but you need a lot of sugar to make jam from them. There is a, a pit inside, just like a regular cherry. Each one has its own little pit. Um, and uh, the leaves, you can't, it's very difficult to see here, but there are little tiny, tiny teeth. It's not quite ciliate. Um, but flowers, uh, like most of our native cherries, in a spike, I'd say that's a spike, um, this is a little bit of gray area between spike and racine in my world, um, but whoops, there we go, this bark, these buds, this for sure, that's, um, choke cherry, if it's got these little spikes of flowers, little individual five-petaled flowers, because it's in the rose family, then, um, uh, and if the leaves aren't shiny, then it's probably choke cherry. Uh, pretty straightforward. Now, should this be in the perennial section or the shrub section? We don't have a sub-shrub section. This is a neat little difference, like a lavender. It's called a sub-shrub, uh, which basically means little short shrub. We usually see this in the perennial section of a gardening catalog, or in the, no, sorry, Anya, Schubert cherry isn't invasive. 
uh, invasive, sorry, this is important. Things that aren't from here, but are aggressive, we call invasive. Things that are from here, and Schubert cherry is um, uh, Prunus virginia and a Schubert eye. Um, things that aren't are from here and spread like mad, we call aggressive. Not from here, invasive. From here and spread like mad, aggressive. Uh, we may or may not like aggressive things. Um, I love Canada goldenrod, but I wouldn't put it in a regular garden because pretty soon there'll be nothing but goldenrod, um, which is only pretty for a little while. Beloved by creatures, though. So these little okasha, these little urn-shaped flowers tell us that it's in. Actually, I'm not sure. Is it ericaceous? No, I'm having doubts. Don't doubt yourself now, Sean. This is an, one of those impossible botanical names. Arctostophilus uva ursi. You really want to shut people up? Keep a botanical name like that in your back pocket. People will not argue with you again. It is evergreen. It has these little pink pendulous flowers that are urn-shaped. Um, and these little red berries that are eaten by all sorts of creatures. The leaves are somewhat rubbery. This will grow anywhere but deep shade. I've seen it in a fair bit of shade. I've seen it in blazing hot sun on a rock that you're like, how are you living there? Uh, this is a great ground cover. And for those people who love periwinkle, who I'm sure none are here tonight, um, this is a good alternative for periwinkle. So if you got a friend who just won't let periwinkle go, get them a couple of these. Um, very distinctive, nothing is like it. Uh, pretty darn short, um, I'd say six inches tall tops. Um, but very creeping. The more shade it gets, the more upright it will go. Um, it's got to be in the Arachisi family. I want to look that up. Um, <clears throat> anyway, uh, speaking of the Arachisi family, so blueberries and heaths and heathers and rhododendrons and so on, there's that similar bell shaped flower. Uh, this is deciduous. Um, thank you, Vanessa. You're awesome. Um, it is in the Ericaceae family. So we, we we put things in families based on their reproductive parts. Uh, so when you look at the flowers of things that's in the fruits, that's how we, we block plants into different groups. Now, uh, blueberries, vicinium. There's lots of things that are in the vicinium family, by the way. Cranberries, blueberries, lingonberries. Uh, they are deciduous, and or at least blueberries are. Beautiful fall color. Again, great garden plant, except it's bunny fodder. Bunnies go nuts on this. Um, there are other things that have blue fruit, but look at the little star on the bottom of the fruit. That's pretty darn distinctive. Um, that's a very misleading picture, actually. This here, this stem here is the blueberry. Behind here, these leathery leaves, that's uh, Gautheria or wintergreen. Um, so yeah, these stems here ah, are the blueberry. That's even better. Uh, again, alternate um, and uh, great. Uh, fall color, uh, a lovely, lovely plant. Um, what else to tell you about that? The leaves are entire, so there's no little bits and pieces um, sticking out from them. There's no lobes or anything like that. They're the leaf a little kid would draw, basically. Very simple and straightforward. And these, uh, and because it's not bearberry, Arctostophilos, um, this has rounded leaves, but these feel leathery. These do not. They're, they're nice and soft. There's even a velvet leaf blueberry, even softer. Um, where am I here? Okay, so I'm just checking on the time because I'm, ooh, ooh. to pick it up, I'm not sure. Uh, this is a very common plant. This is meadow sweet or spirea alba. Alba means white. I want to give you a whole lesson in not scaring you about botanical names. Everybody knows a singer named Jesse White. They just don't know it. Jessica Alba. And the composer named Joe Green, Giuseppe Verdi. Um, so, uh, lovely white flowers, uh, little spikes of flowers, um, very delicate brown stems. These are the seed heads, which look lovely in the wintertime. Great garden candidate and great uh, plant for rain gardens. Um, I would say yes, Bruce, um, that uh, most likely the blueberries that we just looked at are the ones that you see in uh, uh, Georgian Bay. This is the most common blueberry that you're likely to find around here. I've, I've seen velvet leaf blueberry. 
Uh, I have not seen high bush blueberry in the wild, not knowingly at any rate. And there's all sorts of things like huckleberry and so on. Huckleberries are black and related. Um, these little, they, they look for all the world like lilacs. That means that they're a panicle, this flower. So you see that you've got a stem uh, and then with many little flowers on it, a stem, many little flowers and so on. But the fine branching and these little sort of, uh, almost like little Christmas trees is the best way to describe them. Uh, fairly dark brown flowers, um, very, this one's in the wild, so it's very messy. Um, this one's not, it's in the botanical garden. Um, the leaves have fairly prominent teeth on them. They're a little bit bluish. Uh, again, this is a plant that I would look, and you'll see these last year's uh, seed heads. So really this is all you need to look for is these seed heads, because you'll see last year's seed heads on the plant this year, they'll still be persisting there, uh, which makes for great winter interest. I am a landscape designer, an eco landscape designer, first and foremost. Uh, so you'll see that creeping into my assessments of these plants a fair bit. Also, because I think they really deserve a place in our gardens. Um, here's a plant that we should all be using more. This is New Jersey tea. Uh, it, people love hydrangeas right now. And, and this looks like a little miniature hydrangea. Flowers in early summer with these beautiful little puffs of flowers, food for the uh, endangered mottled dusky wing butterfly, deeply veined leaves, almost like a mock orange, assuming some of you are actually also gardeners, um, small teeth along the edges, um, and uh, incredible, I don't have a close up of the flowers, but the, the seeds are this sort of wine red yeah, bunnies do love them. You're right. Uh, but it seems to grow back fast and still flowers. And I think eventually the bunnies will get tired of them, or at least they'll get to the point where they can fend for themselves. Also, planting things in communities, even in your garden, helps mask the, the tasty stuff. Uh, but this is definitely a garden plant. Wine uh, seed heads. And these are very ge geometric. When you look at them up close, there we go. They're sort of three-sided and ridged. Really cool. I almost like the seed heads more than the plant itself. Um, and uh, you can even see in, well, not as much in this picture. Uh, you can see here that the leaves are delicately toothed and deeply veined. Um, most of the time that you're gonna be out looking for them, you'll either see the flowers, in which case I would, I naturalize it and uh, I naturalist it and um, go back later in the season. And then you can find it when it's uh, got the seed heads on it. Uh, but really a, an amazing plant. Uh, two leaves, deeply veined, geometric seed heads. Those are the biggies. One of my new favorite plants here. Um, this is sand cherry prunus pumila. Now I've seen this growing in super clay soil uh, and super, you'll see it almost always growing in super sandy soil on dunes and such. Um, yes, sorry, I got I almost gave credit to the wrong person, but this is, that's right. Um, little tiny teeth, very long, narrow leaves, spectacular fall color. As I said, you'll see it on dunes and in sandy soil. I've grown it in clay soil here, and it's a gorgeous shrub. A small shrub, it's good for urban gardens. It is alternate. Um, these long, thin leaves look almost like willow leaves, various different varieties of willow. Um, I don't know it in flower, actually. I assume it has a little white five petaled flower. Um, maybe pink, no, it's white. Uh, and these berries are very distinctive. And you see how they look just like little cherries, right? You've got a little stem and what looks exactly like a little cherry. Uh, I haven't tried these, but I bet they're awfully good. Uh, and these will also fruit more heavily in some years than other years. That's very common. Another one of my favorite plants, if it, wait. Um... Okay, the flowers are white with red accents. Uh, very attractive to me and butterflies. I like that. Uh, substitute for arctic willow. Good question, Anya. Yeah, I would say so. In fact, I have, uh, now there's an invasive plant, which I used to credit as being native. I'm sorry, I misread the post once upon a time. Um, arctic willow is bad. Uh, sand cherry is good. And it is a much better choice than uh, arctic willow. Uh, Arctic willow is a Siberian thing, unfortunately. Um, 
this is a plant which I quite like. Uh, low, I would call this low vase shaped. It's always low and flat like this. It has what we call juvenile foliage. So it's got little needles. A lot of junipers, the needles are tiny, tiny and oppressed to the stem. They hug the stem. This has, we call them awls, A-W-L. Uh, so it's got these little needles. They are blue white. They have a blue white line down one side. They're fairly good for fruit. They're excellent cover for little birds. And if you want to encourage birds in your garden or encourage pretty workers, I imagine, you want about 30% cover somewhere they can go and hide when there's predators for them to be happy. They turn sort of bronzy in the winter. The other juniper you're going to see here most often is Eastern Red Cedar, Junipus virginiana, and it's more upright. In fact, you can see one in the background in this picture here. Uh, Junipus virginiana is, is much more upright, and this is a low, flat thing. This will grow in the graveliest of gravel soils, so you'll see it a lot if you're driving up to Wasega Beach or up to Muskoka along the roadsides. You'll see this very distinctly. Um, I don't know much about winter harvest, um, but an excellent plant. Um, Junipers communis is the most widely grown species of plant in the world, uh, all around the northern hemisphere, Junipers communis. This is Canada juniper, or common, well, technically this is Canada juniper. Common juniper is just Junipers com uh, communis, and then there are lots of subspecies, like Depressa, because it's low, not, not the other kind of Depressa. This is beaked hazel, and I think we should be growing more hazels in the garden. Uh, in fact, I used some of the design American hazel yesterday. These are lovely plants. All sorts of different lepidopteric caterpillars feed on them. Um, it's called beaked hazel because it has this long beak on it. And usually fruits in twos, big fuzzy fruits. Uh, a rounded leaf that looks uh, asymmetrical, a little bit like witch hazel, but it's super fuzzy. Uh, deeply veined, very uh, somewhere between soft and rough to the texture. It's not clean and smooth. Uh, again, it is alternate. But the most distinctive thing about this fellow is these uh, catkins. These are next year's flowers. They're very prominent in winter. Uh, if you're driving down the road and you heard a bunch of chickadees going nuts, stop and look because you're going to find all sorts of birds there to feed on the various lepidoptera that feed on this. It's, I would say it's almost as good as... Uh, Alms, um, Alder. Um, what else to tell you about this? The fruit's the big giveaway. If, I mean, you're you're going to see these pretty prominently, um, so you're not going to be able to mistake them for anything else. If it's winter time and you want a note to go back later, these little catkins in in groups of four are pretty distinctive uh, and fuzzy leaves. Um, <laughs> holes and leaves are good. Holes and leaves tell us that all sorts of creatures are feeding on it. Um, uh, now this is Corylus americana, closely related to Corylus cornuta. And you'll see no beak, right? On this, that doesn't have that beak, but still the distinctive. It's a hazelnut. What, is it, what does it look like? It looks like the inside of a Ferrero Rocher chocolate. Um, it's a very distinct little nut that's there. Um, if you're not sure, try and peel away the, the green stuff, and, and you'll see what is unmistakably a hazelnut in there. This one has the catkins in threes. Um, and you can see here really closely the uh, the texture of the leaf. I don't find the leaves all that distinctive from each other. This is a little more toothy and um, um, not quite lobed, but it's it's got sort of, mm, it's incised a little bit. Ah, roses. Now, not a great candidate for the regular garden. These spread like mad underground. Most of our native roses spread like mad underground. Five petals tells you it's in the rose family uh, very clearly. Uh, very lovely yellow anthers in here. All sorts of bees will be feeding on this and butterflies too. Um, the These hips, I don't know why we call them hips, the fruits that are here, high in vitamin C, lots of seeds in there, lots of different insects, again, feed on roses. Um, Rosa blanda is fairly smooth. There are native roses that are all covered in the beaked decopus like American. Yes, Marianne. Oh, hi. Mm -hmm. See you there. Um, yes, it can. Um, absolutely, it can. In, in fact, it would like to be done every now and then. Coppicing is to cut a plant all the way down to the ground every once in a while. And um, 
the Europeans do it to make firewood and sticks and so on. Um, and and both of the hazels, by the way, have beautiful straight branches on them. Um, reddish branches, alternate uh, compound leaf. We've been waiting for that word for, oh, no, I guess we saw it on the hickory. Um, threes and fives on the leaves generally. Um, I can't remember if I've seen seven. Almost waxy. They hold water very prettily on the leaves, fairly deep veined. But this is a rose that has very few thorns on it. That's how to tell it from most of the other roses. Um, yeah. Mm, snowberry. I like snowberry because it's food for a really cool little day flying moth called the snowberry clear wing. Uh, people will say, oh, I saw a baby hummingbird or I saw a giant bee. Uh, if you're describing that, then you saw a clear wing sphinx and a hummingbird uh, clear snowberry clear wing uh, feeds its larvae feed just on uh, symphora carpos. Uh, lovely white berries in the fall. Um, the leaves are interesting. They're very variable. So you see this one here is entire. This one here has little baby lobes, almost like a little baby oak leaf bluish, a little bit of a bluish waxy tinge to the leaf, very finely branched. In the summertime, these branches are a bit yellowy orange. Um, I suppose in the winter they are too. Uh, these are the fruits. They are beloved by all sorts of species of birds, and they taste like absolute nothing. Uh, I've, I've eaten some of them, and they taste like water. Actually, they don't even taste like water. Am I chewing something? I feel like I'm chewing something. This is a very distinctive plant, another plant that deserves a place in the landscape, a really nice, uh, nice shrub in the garden. And I'm close to running out of time. Oh, Sean. Um, so to me, and I, I like to think I'm pretty good at what I do, this shrub looks a lot like this shrub. A rat's nest of branches. I spoke about it very sweetly here, but it is kind of a rat's nest of branches. Um, little tiny buds. Um, I would look for the fruit to tell that it isn't honeysuckle, honeysuckle bad, uh, snowberry good. But uh, this is also more coarse in texture, visual texture. Uh, these branches are larger. You see how big, tiny, tiny, this guy is it's almost like a thread. And, and this is more bold. The leaves even are a little bit similar. Um, but these are opposite. Oh, and so are these. Damn. Um, but look, I looked. See? So you got to look. Look for the buds. They may not be a guaranteed lock, but it's a good place to start. Uh, but this is a horribly invasive plant. And it's still sold in the trade, but we're working on that. Um, <clears throat> and we talked about buckthorn. I told you I'd have a picture of buckthorn. To many people, including me, frankly. Um, oh, thanks, Anya. Uh, invasive honeysuckle has hollow stems. Hmm. Good to know. Thank you. So I don't have them on me now, but I always carry a pair of snips or secateurs on me. Um, and so it's a good thing to do. It's a good thing to have. If you cut it and you see that it has hollow stems, then you know that it's uh, honeysuckle. Thanks, honey. Um, so buckthorn. In this case, it's greenish, but it isn't always. It's often sort of that bronzy color, almost always actually, like um, choke cherry. But choke cherry, the buds stick out. And this, now in this case, this is, you might be fooled by that being opposite. Buckthorn is extremely variable. It's all over the place, but look how the buds hug the stem. What about the thorn, Sean? Shouldn't you look for the thorn? Yeah, thorns are not always that visible in buckthorn. Uh, it hides between these two buds and sometimes you'll see it in the axles, the divisions of branches. Uh, this sometimes looks opposite, uh, here, I would call this one sub-opposite, but this is, I would say, alternate to sub-opposite. Um, it's all over the place, but this is a horrible, horrible plant. This is one that gives me nightmares at night. We've killed about, probably getting up near a thousand on the property that I live on. Birds love the berries though, right? Yeah, they're harmful to the birds. Um, Lori, maybe you want to reach out to me. I, I, ask me at the end, and if we have time about how to get rid of buckthorn, I would love to answer that question because I have a horrible hate on for buckthorn. Uh, it is my one of my two least favorite plants. The other being Phragmites. Um, interesting how they both sound like you're swearing when you start saying them. Uh, da, 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 da. Yeah, buds are oppressed. That's the big thing. 
if you're looking for choke cherry, uh, the buds stick out. All cherries. Very few things have buds that hug the stem that are pressed to the stem. Um, some resources. So a lot of the pictures that were there were from World Plants. Um, if we send this out, Maxwell, these are clickable links for folks. iNaturalist, I am thoroughly addicted to iNaturalist. Uh, Ontario Wildflowers is a wonderful site, which gives you lots of information. Some of the pictures from this uh, came from there, I believe. Um, I like iNaturalist in so many ways. For starters, it helps you uh, learn things. It also helps you because people will tell you if you're right or wrong, and I'm not always right. Um, people will jump in and say, no, that's not that kind of plant. Um, and, and next week, we're going to do the perennials, and iNaturalist is really handy with the perennials. But it's a good start. If you see something on one of these pages, or maybe you use picture this, uh, to me, picture this is notoriously difficult because you need backup. It kind of, my experience, and maybe I was using it more when the AI was young, my experience is that I want to go find a, a second choice. It's very off the cuff. Oh, yeah, it's one of these. Um, whereas... Uh, iNaturalist will be very careful and give you the options and say, this is what's likely to be seen in your area. Um, so, you know, uh, go look up images. Okay. It says it's this. I can go look it up online and look for images of it. And maybe uh, what, if you search, what's the, if you just search red oak versus black oak, eventually you'll find two branches side by side that show you the differences. Uh, we live in a wonderful time. I keep telling my students that we have the Library of Alexandria in our pocket here. Uh, all the information is there. Now, um, I love questions. I love questions in a public format um, because people, everybody will learn from the answer. Well, individual questions are great. You can email me anytime. Um, I'm very active on Facebook, Twitter, all that jazz, and YouTube. Don't forget to subscribe. Um, but uh, um I really love public questions because that's how everybody lives. So if you think about something after we sign off, feel free to ask me on Facebook or something. Um, and uh, beyond that, uh, I'm going to stop sharing now. Um, and then folks can ask questions. Uh, aha. Oh, Bush. Uh, see, there's the common name thing, Charlene. Nice work. Uh, you're just feeding me a path to run down. Right? That's awesome. So bush honeysuckle, not a honeysuckle, not in any way, shape or form is a honeysuckle. Uh, bush honeysuckle is diarvila. Lovely plant, amazing plant, came up with the symposium I was at today and uh, spreads and has little yellow flowers and very similar leaves, hence the name probably, and very good for biodiversity as well. We do have native honeysuckle, uh, three species, at least three. Uh, fly honeysuckle being the one that I bump into most often. I was going to say the most common, but that's very Sean-centric. Um, uh, <laughs> I would love to do a webinar on botanical names. Um, it really is fun. Like people get all daunted by it, but it, it's fun. Um, so yeah, there are native honeysuckles. Most of them aren't very sun tolerant. Most of them like a little bit northern or northern in spirit, if that makes sense. And what I mean by that, uh, where I live is north of Milton, just up on the escarpment near a giant forest called the Holden Agreement Forest. And so the climate here is very moderate. And you don't see balsam firs very happy this far south. And yet we have them here and they're lovely and happy. Uh, I'm sure if I went romping through the woods, in fact, I, I've found, I have found honeysuckle in the Holden Agreement Forest. Um, so they need a forest setting. I've tried moving one to the garden and every year it got a little smaller until it died. Um, so I didn't do that. Um, but uh, yeah, we do have them here. Most of the ones that you're going to see down here, unfortunately, are the invasive things. If you can survive in Mongolia, you can take over the world. Um, the best way to get rid of buckthorn is a really complicated question um, because it depends on scale. I have an extractigator, which is a really funky tool that you can put around the trunk of something. It's got a foot on it, which acts like a fulcrum and a long handle, which acts like a lever. And you can pull medium-sized trees and small trees out of the ground. Uh, there are bag systems that you can get. You can just cut them down and put those over it. and It excludes light. I usually tell people to put a couple of pots on it, cut it down so it's six inches tall, and then put a couple of plastic pots offset on top of it and a rock. So you're excluding light. You leave it six inches tall so the plant will try and grow from there, 
but it's got no light. And weirdly, they need light. Um, I've been reading lately this summer that if you go through, and this is all if you only have a few, uh, and you don't want to do when they're in Barry, um, not the city, because they're going to drop berries everywhere. You're going to make more of a mess and more buckthorns because they're very fecund. They, they germinate super easy. But if you go through in like early summer, lop them off at six feet high. Drag that away, get it out of it. Uh, you don't have to if it doesn't have berries on it. It's a great habitat. Um, and then they start to grow. Ha, I'm okay, sucker. They produce suckers. You cut it off below that. And it's going to go, okay, I'm okay. And they'll burn a bunch of carbohydrates and put out more suckers. And then you cut it off again and it's probably done. Come back and check it next year. If you only have a moderate number or if your area isn't that large, that's a great way to do it. Um, I'm not sure if it's forbidden or not to talk. I, I um, Full disclosure, my son does invasive species control and he uses chemicals because the scale that he's doing things on, it's just not feasible for us to do everything by um, hand control, uh, unfortunately. Um, same with Phragmites, it's next to impossible to control and, and therefore you might need chemical help. Um, but you gotta do the math on every single situation. Can I do this on my own? Am I doing more good than harm, taking the time to do it? Uh, if you can do it in a, in a, I was gonna say eco-friendly, but the in this case, the pesticides, and I feel weird saying that, um, it is eco-friendly because you're doing a great amount of good in a short amount of time. But if you can do it by hand, then then absolutely do it that way. Um, be very careful when it's in, when it's got fruit on it. Uh, if you, we had to cut one down this fall, I don't know how it missed us or how we missed it, but it was giant and covered in fruit. And so I cut it off and we carried it gently out to the lawn where any bits that grow are going to get mulched by the lawnmower and then we put it on a burning pile to burn it and we were very fastidious about how we burned it i even have my neighbor let me take down some of his buckthorn that were in fruit there are boy and girl buckthorn plants some plants have boy and girl parts on the same plant and some plants have boy plants and girl plants like um sparkleberry or winterberry um alex verticillata um yeah as long as the cut parts don't have berries on them who cares they're not going to root um Oh, uh, Christine, learning more about invasive species. The Invasive Species Center has their annual forum on this week. Cool. Okay. Thank you, Christine. That's awesome. Um, if, anyone's, uh, if anyone's really excited about the idea of invasive species removal, we do sometimes have events with volunteers where you can uh, remove garlic mustard and, and other exciting plants at some of our nature reserves. Um, so keep your eyes on our events page on our website and uh, you too. May uh, get to participate in the uh, exciting labor. That's a good example of details matter. Uh, learning the texture of garlic mustard and the shape of the teeth, very distinctive. Once you know the the shape of the veins and the texture of the leaf and the, the way it's toothed, it's actually, we call it reniform, it's kidney shaped and it's got little rounded teeth, then you got it. Is it compound or not? It's not compound. So if you found something that was compound, I, I, I'm telling you this story because I, I heard a story about a restoration job that was done and then volunteers went in to pull the garlic mustard that came up after it had been pulled a few times and they pulled out hepaticas and all sorts of other things. Details matter when you're doing plant ID. Ah, that's a good face. That's exactly the face I was looking for. Um, my concern, waterfront. Okay, so uh, just bouncing back for a second. Um, I'm a big fan of refugia piles. So piling a whole bunch of sticks together in one place makes habitat for all sorts of things like shrews. And my property is very long and thin and there's a series of ponds through it and then it empties into 16 Mile Creek, which becomes Oakville Harbor. And uh, that creek runs past the back of the house. We made a big refugia pile out of buckthorn and honeysuckle a couple of years ago. And it's been knitting down ever since. And I came around the corner the other day and a mink was, uh, running back into the refugia pile. So refugia piles are great for making homes for all sorts of things. We clean up way too much in the garden, tuck it behind some shrubs, make it in art, whatever you want to do, grow some uh, virgin's bower clematis on it or any number of different vines. Um, make it ornament, hide it away, whatever. What falls on a property should stay on a property. Um, and you know, so we, we took all that buckthorn and made it good. 
uh, a friend of mine would tell me to make biochar out of it, um, which is a whole process, but another really cool thing to do with something that's otherwise very, 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 very bad. Have I missed any questions? New Jersey tea growing deeply tap-rooted in sandy situations in the Ottawa Valley, really. I know it down in the Long Point area. Um, the range of soil moisture, I've seen it, I've heard it spoken of, uh, even in, in rain gardens, it seems a lot of our native plants are super broadly tolerant. Um, I saw a recommendation today that uh, blue flag iris was needed moisture. Uh, and I'm like, that's not true. Plants can't read the textbooks. I saw um, blue flag iris growing at St. William's Nursery on top of a green roof, raised up. on the, They had these bags made of jute filled with this Gaia mix. So they made topography on their rain garden. Super cool. Blazing sun, super dry. It grew from seed, so it adapted to the situation. So there it was, blooming away, happy as a clam, uh, absolutely where it shouldn't. Um, so I'm, I'm very, plant it, see if it grows. You know, you, you'll be surprised more often than not. Um, acidity of the soil, much more broadly tolerant than we give plants credit for. Um, I don't, yeah, I, I can't really tell you the, the range. I mean, I know I've grown it in Milton clay. I know it's growing well in about a foot of mulch uh, at my butterfly garden in Beamsville. I didn't mulch it. Uh, and, and it's almost subsoil below that. Uh, it seems to be really tolerant. Uh, T, you have a question? Oh, yes, T. Oh, there it is. Is that it? Nope. Why can't I see T's question? There was a hand raised. Um, if I missed that, I'm sorry. I, I probably clicked on something bad. Um, oh, DSV, dog strangling vine. Uh, the Ontario Invasive Plant Council, OIPC. If you search Ontario Invasive Plant Council, dog strangling vine, you will get best management, best practice management pamphlets. Uh, I, I help out with the OIPC. I helped write the Grow Me Instead Guide. Uh, amazing organization. Uh, I'm not sure if they do fundraising or not, but they deserve it. If you if you can give them money, do so. Uh, but most invasive species, serious invasive species, are listed on their site and how best to control them. Uh, really, really useful resource. And some of them you got to be careful with. Uh, like hogweed. Um, but it's it's an awful plant. Now, the thing about invasive species, and I know that's not what we're talking about today, early detection and eradication. So look for things that are getting out of control and get them. And if you're looking at a big property, and let's say there's a huge clump of Phragmites, you want to go after the big clump. Go after the satellite populations, because while you're trying to kill the big clump, the satellite populations will be taking over the world. So one of the strategies to go is to go after the satellite populations, then you can go after the big one. I know it's still going to be dropping seeds, but they all are. That's why you go after the satellite populations. Okay. And and really do the assessment on them. There's some things that it seems might be almost impossible to control, like uh, Japanese knotweed, which is why you only get it young. Um, you know, unless it's in seed, you don't need to get rid of the green matter, uh, Anya. The if it's in seed, that's a problem. But if it isn't, like the if the buckthorn doesn't have seeds on it, just treat it like any other branch. If the dog strangling vine uh, doesn't have flowers on it, then don't worry about it. Uh, if now, if it has seeds, then I would bag it like garbage bag it and I would make sure it goes in the garbage. Uh, I don't yet trust, and you're getting my opinion here. Um, I don't yet trust municipal composting systems. Uh, if someone stops paying attention for a few minutes or if it blows off the top of the pile, you're going to be making life worse. So I have gone there with a truckload of buckthorn and they said no that's got to go in the compost and i said really because i i'm not sure if the composting kills the seeds and the the person at the kiosk went i talked to the guy at the bins so off i went and we had the same conversation and he said yeah another composting process kills the seeds and i said really because at the ontario invasive plant council we were hiring interns this summer to actually see if the seeds were being killed so i'm not sure if you know that yet or not and he went okay put it in the bin fine 
Um, so stand your ground. Um, if you can't burn it uh, and burn it well, don't try burning things like Japanese knotweed. You're not going to kill it. It can live through a volcanic eruption. It, it it can live through a lava flow going over it and then come back. It's it's alien craziness. Um, 20 feet down, it can go dormant for 20 years. Ah, someone's cutting me. Duck. And stay that way for 20 years. It's, it's just, we're now trying to inject herbicides into the crown to kill it. And we're not sure if that's going to. It may still just duck and cover for 20 years, which is boggling to me. Anyway, I've gone way off uh, the beaten path here, um, but it seemed like people wanted to know that sort of thing. That's my excuse. I'm sticking to it. Um, and Maxwell, feel free to give me the hook whenever it's time to quit. Um, but uh, oh no, I'm, I'm happy to but... you keep answering questions. <laughs> okay, it's been wonderful listening to you talk. Well, thank you. I'm lucky. I know what I know. What I I, I like what I do. Uh, and that makes it easy to learn about it. And I'm, I, I collect experts um, like Aileen. Um, I don't know everything, but I know who to ask if, uh, if I don't know. Uh, and there's always, I mean, if you're gardening or, or even being a naturalist, a hobby or a professional naturalist, and you're bored, you're doing it wrong. There's new stuff to learn absolutely every day. I, it's super, super cool. Um, when you when you get to learn all the birds, ooh, then there's the dragonflies. Like it, it just never stops. So, and we have we have bugs swimming around under the ice. I've never noticed that this year, but I've never looked for it before. We had back swimmers and whirligig beetles and little tiny diving beetles. Um, <laughs> sorry, I'm just looking at the chat window. Apparently, I've ruined opera for me. Um, uh, awesome. Um, it looks like that's all the questions. I don't want to cut anybody off, but remember, feel free to reach out to me on social media uh, or by email. Um, Absolutely. We, uh, as an organization, recently put together a uh, guide to mixes some so management. To, if anyone's interested in that, please feel free to reach out to me. Happy to pass that along. So, yeah, thank you so much for joining us this evening. And uh, I'm Thank looking you. forward and to we'll see you uh, next, next week. week. Yeah. All awesome. right. Everybody awesome. have a great awesome. night.